What are you in a mood for? I thought you went to the theatre last night. Yeah, I did. Kez, I was outraged. Really? Why? <gasps> was it political? Yeah, it was Dick Whittington. They don't even throw sweets out anymore. <sighs> Run titles. Hello, welcome to the Culture Cafe. Where we explore art and culture in Hull and beyond. So I know my first theatrical experience was in theatre. Um, definitely going to see the Panto. What about our guest? Marvin, what was your first theatrical experience? Well, although these days I write mostly for uh, television and radio and, and non-fiction books, um, my first love is, is theatre. That's where I started off. Um, many years ago I started off as the writer-in-residence at Manchester's Library Theatre. Right. And I wrote a number of plays for them and then a number of plays for uh, other, well, mainly reps. Uh, but, uh, yeah, always go back to my first love, which is theatre. Great stuff. Audrey? Well, when I was young, uh, Panto was just starting up in Hull after the war. Right. And we used to have to queue for tickets. Everybody wanted to go to the Panto. And it was, and, and I do remember at least two Christmases queuing for a long time and having to stand in the aisles. Excellent. Well, while we're talking about theatre, why don't we actually have a look at what a theatre is? Let's take a look. Before television, even before cinema, if you wanted to see a story acted out, you had to visit a place like this. But what is theatre? I've been invited to take a tour around Derby Theatre to see what it takes to put on a big professional production. Seeing as though I'm having a tour, I've asked the lighting guy to give me just a little sneak peek at what they do. Uh, in front of us now we have our lighting desk. We have two lighting desks. Uh, uh, so one here and one here. Yeah. One is there to take over should one fail during a show. Right. Um, there's a, it's, it's less than a second, the turnover time between one desk taken over from the other should one fail. Uh, from this desk, we, uh, during our produce shows and, and when we have shows coming in on tour, quite often they might have it saved on a stick, so we'll just plug in the stick and it tends to gives us all the information we need on, onto the computer. But what happens if you don't have a theatre space to call your own? Ensemble 52 are a theatre company that believe that theatre can and perhaps should happen anywhere. Ensemble 52 is um, a sort of it's a theatre company, uh, although we also do lots of other cultural activity um, within the company. We uh, set up in 2007. Um, it's myself um, as the artistic director, and I started it with a writer called Richard Bajet, and then. Um, a year later, Dave Windass, who's another writer, came on board. We produce theatre, um, self-produced theatre, normally original works um, that tend to be uh, produced in Hull and around Hull, but we have taken um, that work out on the road. We've taken it to London, Manchester. We do quite a lot of work on the Manchester Fringe. And then three years ago, we formed a relationship with the Bassey Arts Centre in London, and now we produce the twice yearly Heads Up Festival as well, which sees us bring in um, major established and acclaimed works from all over the world, um, as well as surrounding it with our own work and supporting the work of other regional theatre makers. Then we just start to discuss who's going to be best to um, produce the work, so you know who's going to write the script, who's going to normally I, I, we take the lead on direction. Um, and then, then it's finding the money inevitably, um, and and then casting and putting the technical side together. How we're going to present it, whether we know where we're going to present it. Big theatre with amazing lighting and sets can add a sense of occasion and brilliance to any live performance. But the real magic takes place because of that live performance. The experience in a theatre and in a Dishu's warehouse may be different, but both are equally full of wonder and excitement. That was great. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually intrigued to know um, about themes, you know, themes of um, the work that you have created. Uh, what kind of themes are present in your works? Because I know that you both um, write. So, Marvin. 
Right. Uh, themes in mind uh, tend to be to do with, there's always a kind of a political aspect to it. Um, for example, at the moment I'm working on a, a new play which is about zero hours contracts. Um, right, yeah. <clears throat> I tend to try and be fairly contemporary uh, in what I try and uh, look at in my plays these days. When I started off, uh, my first three plays were about uh, the goons, Oliver Hardy and uh, the American writer Dorothy Parker, um, all of which I hugely enjoyed, but as the years have gone by, I kind of have taken a different route slightly with my theatrical work um, because I think there's so much that's got to be said about what we have out there, really. Yeah, it is such a powerful medium to get messages across to the audience. Um, wouldn't you agree, Audrey? Yes, yes it is, but of course I'm a poet more than a playwright. Uh, I mean, when you're beginning uh, to write, uh, you try them all. But I, I, my, my themes are really kind of uh, the mysteries of life and, um, and uh, you know, trying to incorporate nature and um, people and healing, I think. The, I, I see my poetic works as addressing those kind of things. That's great. Thank you, Audrey. So we actually went out and uh, had an experience of some new writing. Which was poetic in its own right. And we had a great time. Here we are in uh, Hull City Centre. Let's see what they've got for us this week. It's a cold night. I hope it's something that's going to keep us warm. Cass, Thank you very much. Envelope number one. You are standing very close to one of the country's best known theatres. Right, yes. We have arranged for you to go and see their latest play, so go and get your tickets. Excellent! Wow, that's brilliant. Hello. Hello, ladies. We're, um, we're here to collect some tickets this evening. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Excellent. What is it? Martha Josie and the Chinese Elvis. So, Fantastic. here we are. We're gonna see some theater. A trip to the theatre is also a night out. We have booked you a meal in the Hull Truck Bar. Enjoy. Oh, fantastic. Wow. Thanks a lot. While you are waiting for your food to arrive, take an Elvis selfie. Just seen the first hour. Yes, we have. Um, and now it's time for the interval. We're on a cliffhanger. Yeah, basically. Like, um, dum, dum, dum. Somebody, someone that we thought had died has just showed up to gate crash a party. Yeah. Very, very good ending. Very really nice, lovely. The Elvis side moved. A nice shrink was uh, revealed, and she started ice skating on it. And at the end, it actually it snowed. snowed. It the snowed on us. It was great. The really audience good. were loving it. Did you enjoy it? I did enjoy it. I enjoyed that Chinese Elvis. <laughs> A lovely evening we had there, it, Carrie. It was a lovely night in a. It was what you can expect on a traditional night to the theatre. It is. Um, but I just want to ask the guests um, the magic of live performance and performing in more non traditional performance spaces. Have you got any experience with working in non traditional spaces? And is the magic retained? 
Yeah, most definitely. I, for me, that's when <coughs> theatre becomes most exciting, when you take it out of uh, like traditional buildings. Uh, I've had a plan in the past uh, which was doing a disused warehouse, and the atmosphere of that is just right. incredible. Mm. Um, I love that idea of, uh, say for example, we had Ensemble 52's director, Andrew Pearson, on earlier, and uh, he was talking about you know work they do. Last year, they went out onto the train to Hull doing with some weddings. Yeah, that was great. Which is that's just how cool is that you know so I think that whole idea about although theatre building theatre buildings have got their place and velvet seats have got their place I think it's really great that theatre goes out to people as well as kind of beckoning them in great Thanks. well on that note I think what we'll do is uh, time to have a brew are you making it or? I think it'd be better if Carrie makes the brew yeah that's it, what you do I'll put it down to a fine art <laughs> Hello, welcome back to the Culture Cafe. So, we've been um, chatting during the break about the history of theatre and what's inspired us in the past. So, Audrey? Well, having studied Shakespeare, you know, um, it, you can't help but be influenced by Shakespeare. Mm. I mean, it's a whole new world, isn't it? And you have to learn the language and everything. Um, and the old mystery plays, you know, that used to go yes. out on horse and cart around the villages. Travelling. So in a way, it seems that, 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 you know, nothing's changed. In a way, everything's changed. And yeah. modern theatre's brought such a lot of fresh input, really, and fresh ideas. But in some ways, they're very much the same as they always were, and people always want theatre. That's great. I Thank agree you for that, with Audrey. That. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a little look at a bit of uh, Hull, uh, uh, Hull, a dramatic life. I'm standing in Kingston Square in Hull, which is an important place for the vibrant theatre life of the city. Behind me is the new theatre, which is going through tremendous refurbishment and change. It stands close by where the Little Theatre once stood, which was the home of repertory in Hull when it first came to the city. We're exploring the changing face of theatre in Hull, from repertory to the present day. From before the Second World War and into the 1950s, repertory was a staple of live entertainment. I met Katie Wood, and she has a collection of memorabilia from her grandfather's days. My grandfather, um, from records that I have, um, I, sadly I never, never met him, never knew him, he died before I was born, um, but he worked as head carpenter at the Little Theatre. Um, my nana also worked at the theatre, the Little Theatre, our new theatre, as a dresser, and she always referred to them as the Little and the New. When I, when I go say I'm going to the theatre, she used to say, are you going to the new? <laughs> and oh. so we have this marvellous collection of people who went through the theatre. These were the travelling companies that came to Hull and moved on. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there were famous. Let's have a, a little run through of some of the famous people that came with these. I wonder how famous they were when they were actually here. Yes. Maybe just starting out. We have... Um, some autographed postcards here to my aunt um, from Flora Robson, who became Dame Flora Robson. She did. Didn't she, she did. Yes. yes. Um, star of film and theatre. Yes, yeah. she went into yes. film. Yeah. And Richard Attenborough. The signed postcard there of, of Lauren Hardy, just something that came as a complete surprise to me when I came through yes. this collection. We have a picture there of yeah. Stuart Granger somewhere. Somewhere in here. And all these ah there he is. There he is. We think that's yes. Stuart Granger, yeah. don't we, Katie? Yes. By the nineteen seventies, repertory theatre was very much in its death throes, mostly due to TV, but also the whole way of performing seemed old fashioned and out of touch. I met with Averill Cote at the site of what was the Outreach Community Arts Centre to relive the glorious days of community theatre. 
And I have such good memories of this building, this hall, which was just a special place. People that we met here, it was sociable, just about anybody who was doing anything in community arts or arts with people that wasn't a formal setting met and worked in this building and it was completely accessible. It was fantastic. While community theatre opened up the dramatic arts to a new audience, there was a small but thriving professional scene. I've come to meet with Richard Green, a producer, writer and director who was responsible for many local hit shows. I mean, there are two types of repertory theatre. Um, the first repertory theatre I was in was the Colchester Repertory Theatre, which was weekly rep. And that meant that um, somebody might be playing the lead one week. And if they are playing the lead one week, then they would be rehearsing a small part in the weeks prior to that. So that everybody got a chance of doing it. But it was very hard work. Right, OK, well, when, when I'd left uh, the professional theatre for a time, um, I took to writing plays. I, I wrote several. And I sent them into London companies. Nothing happened. And I then went and had an interview with a man called Mark Berlin at uh, a London management of Norwegian Street. And he said, Mr. Green, the only way that you will get a play up the stage is to do it yourself and then invite people to see it. With the end of community theatre, the dramatic arts are now finding their feet again but with less funding and fewer venues. What is it like now? I spoke with Hayley Buchan to explore how theatre in Hull has changed. So myself and uh, my colleague have written this play um, called She Wears My Ring, and it's based on the uh, fishing families of Hull in the 1960s. So um, we've undertaken quite extensive interviews with members of the fishing community. We've actually based it on a couple that we've met and talked in a lots of detail to them. And it's kind of based on their lives, really. It's a, it's a love story and how they've kind of survived their relationship and their family through a lot of difficult times. Over the years, theatre has changed in Hull. It needs to change, just as life changes. Hull has always had an exciting, vibrant, theatrical connection. Importantly, it always will. That was a nice positive note. It was very lovely, that Audrey. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. In that video, um, we speak of change. So I'm just wondering, what is your take on? the most recent changes, um, theatre for the 21st century. How is theatre moving forward? Um, I think that as, as more and more public subsidy is taken out of theatre, and, and as Audrey mentioned in the, in the clip there, um, there are less theatres uh, around. I think a lot more people, um, because theatre will always survive, it will always adapt, a lot more people are looking at crowdfunding. Um, I know that uh, on the West End, there's even a show on the West End, uh, the uh, improvised musical uh, show, which is fully or, or partly funded through Kickstarter, I believe. You know. That's great, isn't it? It is, it is. And I, I like the fact that um, people are finding a way, you know, it's, I, I wish there were more public subsidy, uh, but there isn't. So what do you do? You know, you get out there and you do something, which is great. Great, people <laughs> taking it into their own hands and mm. put, being passionate about something and pushing it forward, which I, I think is great. What about you, Audrey? How do you see theatre moving forward? Well, I, it's exciting. After doing that piece of film, I found it was uh, really exciting. And what seems to have changed in the present day is that people are just taking it into their own hands Definitely. and doing it and getting on with it. And like with books, you can publish them yourselves and this gives them... Uh, Theatre is doing much the same thing. Um, actors, uh, Hayley Buchan, I know, goes into schools um, and... Uh, and she earns a little money that right. way. She, she's also still a teacher herself. So people are diverse. I think getting uh, it into Multicultural education. in that sense of uh, having a finger in a few pies and mm. keeping it going. It'll never fail. People love stories. They, yes. see, they love to see them. And we've talked about multimedia. 
introducing multimedia into the theatre, in, you know, getting young people interested in that. It's not just people on stage reading lines. What do you think about that, Marvin? I think it's really exciting. I think, again, you know, in terms of making theatre relevant to every new generation, you know, use the mediums that they're used to, you know. I and mean, we, we talked a little bit about Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night, if that's the right <laughs> title. Uh, I mean, the, the, the multimedia uh, platform that they used with that was just amazing. It was great. Blew, blew, yeah. blew your mind, didn't it? It was really, really good. Um, so, you know, like my children um, will go to the theatre, watch performances like that, and, and it draws them in, you know. So it's, it's just using different ways to, to engage, and that's what, what good theatre is all about. Great stuff. What do you think about bringing um, multimedia into theatre then, Kaz? Well, I'm all for it, really, because it's, uh, it's, it's a reflection of what is relevant today and what is going on today. And especially with young people, they're all marvels on the computers, uh, music, they create their own music, um, the visual art. Yes. Uh, and theatre is a really a platform for all those elements to kind of come together. Um, and, and make a statement, a bold statement. And I guess that kind of use of technology is definitely a way of stepping forward because like we were saying, all these things do kind of come around and I'm a firm believer in community theatre and we only saw a play last week called um, Rainbows Over Alcatraz, which was a community-based piece, self-funded, um, set on the Bransholm estate in the 70s. And, and, and this group were, uh, was just a group of women from Hull that had come together and, they were and doing one it, gentleman, you know, they yeah. were doing it themselves. They are doing it themselves. And that's the main thing. So we're going to leave it there. I think that's a good wrap. Thank you very much, Kerry. Thank you for our guest. Thanks for and joining us. And we will see you all again soon. <laughs>